Okay, so finally broadcasting out in Dolby Surround 7.1 um, with all our microphones working, uh, we'll get on to the second talk. Um, hope everyone enjoyed it, Igor's talk. Um, I loved it. Um, my gosh, you guys are hardware questions. <laughs> Flipping heck, wow. Yeah. Um, nicely done, brilliantly done. Um, so yeah, Digger, um, you got all the links, go and have a look. Um, so we move on to the second talk now, which is um, from Anthony, who is going to be talking about um, zero trust security um, in multi-cloud deployments. So I shall get out of the way now. Give it to you, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Anthony. Uh, so I'm going to give you a talk about zero trust uh, security for secure multi-cloud deployment. So it's going to take a little while to understand a uh, certain concept that maybe some of you know or probably new to you, but I'll try and make it easier for everyone to pick up. And again, try and make it a little bit more interactive so we can all catch up something new from this talk anyway. All right, so move on to the next slide. So the agenda is going to be um, just a little talk about why zero trust and, and why do we think it's, it's important and then talk about authentication and authorization. And then afterwards we can you know, entertain some questions and yeah. Okay. So, right, so who am I? Um, all right, so I put on something there. Uh, I'm adventurous and I want to be comedian really. So I'm, I'm gonna try and make some jokes. Uh, it's not funny, but just, you know, clap. <laughs> And, and yes, yeah, just cheer me up, really. So my joke here is I grew up in Lagos. I don't know if anyone has been to Lagos before. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, good, good. And, and um, in Lagos, you, you know, it's, it's a very funny place. It tries your patience. And, and then sometime, you know, you just get a bit frustrated. And one time I decided to do something new. Uh, I tried, I read a book about black magic. Yeah, yeah, anyone tried it? <laughs> no, okay. So I, I said, yeah, well, I, I'm going to try black magic and, and see how, how it all works out. You know, maybe it will help me, but it, it went horribly wrong, right? Because <laughs> this is what happened. I, I burnt my toast. That's not much. Yeah, I need a bit of clap, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the much, the much I did. Uh, I tried to toast the bread and it burnt, and that was the, all about black magic for me, really. <laughs> and then, again, I, I got some hobbies, um, like reading. Uh, don't ask me anything about philosophy books, but it's all IT books that I read, so sorry. Uh, I like traveling. And then I'm a, a loyal Arsenal fan. Uh, loyalty, any Arsenal fan here? Oh no. oh no, sorry guys. Oh come on guys, come on. All right. <laughs> okay, fine. So Arsenal actually is a very funny crop, right? Because uh, they give you a little bit, right? You think you think you're there and then they just ah, take it away from you. So it's it's uh, it's crazy, but but that is it, that's the club. All right, so why is zero trust? So um, before I start, have anybody used Zero Trust in, in deployment recently? Or do anyone know anything about Zero Trust? Are you? Awesome. awesome. What is Zero Trust, anyone? Can you tell me, please? What, anyone tell me what Zero Trust is? Your own understanding of Zero Trust. Is it where no single component in your infrastructure trusts no other component? Right, OK. That's a good, that's a good one. Anyone else? Okay, right, that, that, that's good. Well, zero trust is actually, um, the concept of zero trust is there is trust, but it's not the trust you want, right? It is all the trust you know. It's, it's an implicit trust. So in every network, you must have trust, right? Because you build trust across your boundaries, perimeters, and stuff like that. But zero trust is some trust that you can't see, right? Or you don't, you don't actually know it exists because it's a trust between every single individual component in, in your network, right? So you might have a perimeter network with your Wi-Fi, your firewall, and all that stuff. You do trust them. You believe there's not going to be a breach, right? But whereas with zero trust is even the smallest bit 
of resource deployed or uh, workloads, anything else, you just don't give a trust about them. But then the point is that you actually trust a little bit, but you verify the trust. So the clause or the bottom line there is you need to verify everything before you can say, right, I have fully deployed little trust because the verification is very important. So here's a bit, few details there. Uh, the concept founded by that guy and uh, it centers on the belief that trust is vulnerable and designed in such a way never trust, always very <coughs> fine. So that's, that's very important. And then we've got a few things that, that you know, can actually affect the trust in the system, your perimeter network, your workload first, make sure uh, that that's important, your password, identity, who you are, and then stuff that can actually be compromised. Rans ransomware is also there. And then you've got the new 5G as well, yeah? And zero trust in 5G. I don't know if you, anyone knows about that. So now, so there is the, the, the main ones we actually know every day that you know, we're more used to is zero trust in uh, users access, yeah? Access control, identity, anyone? And then data as well, yeah, you got a lot of data. How do you make sure that uh, you trust the data coming in or going out of your system? Or even stuff like your supply chain, yeah? Open source supply chain, you wanna make sure that zero trust is also applied to you. your devices. Um, we all work remotely these days, so remote networking and all that stuff, you wanna make sure that those are also protected. And then the big one here, away from network traffic, it's applications. So I'm actually more interested in applications. If you're a developer here, yeah, and you need to <laughs> do a bit of work to make sure your system is well protected. And that's what Zero Trust actually leverages, uh, protection for yeah, applications. So in a network, apart from your perimeter firewall, there are attack vectors and then Attack vectors, uh, you know, places that can really be breached on your network, you yeah. Things that are exposed to external entities or bad players. You got your local access, your source code as well, yeah. You got your cloud applications, if you're on the cloud. Um, developers, endpoints and APIs, yeah. And then supply chain, open source, everything you do there, image and all that stuff, yeah. So, it's important to understand why the need for zero trust, right? And then this talk is just not about you know, giving you all that uh, information about zero trust, but also letting you know the cost implication of not applying zero trust to your network. In this case here, this is Capital One, and sometimes they got breached. And what it did to them is, it actually, <laughs> they lost 250 million in damages, right? And then the confidence in the company, yeah, deroded as well. Um, trust is compromised. So that's what happens when you don't. And then the problem with this one is that they actually had a good firewall system, but someone broke, broke into the firewall through a small loophole. And then they paid 250 million in damages for that. So it's, it's very important and expensive not to have zero trust. So. Microsoft, uh, this is just to show you how complicated it is to, well, I'm not saying Microsoft Zero Trust is complicated anyway, but I'm just saying this is a typical example of a deployment that anyone has ever seen this architecture before? Anyone? Okay. So, so this is a Zero Trust architecture when you go to Microsoft website and you say, yeah, um, you click on stuff and they pull down all that information for you, and this is what you get. It's actually quite interesting because in the middle of that, you see zero trust policy, and then you got all that policy optimization, identity as well, your endpoints, threats, everything else, yeah? So that's how you actually have that, you know, from a cloud provider. Microsoft does very good zero trust um, deployment, really, I must say. Okay, so but, the biggest challenge with zero trust is something always get compromised, and in this case, identity. Your identity, like I signed in my username and password there, uh, that, that's a bad player who's willing to compromise your identity. 
So always, always make sure your identity is protected and Zero Trust does that. So in order to do Zero Trust, <coughs> in our case, it's multi-cloud deployment. So in that case, then we're not actually tied to a particular cloud environment, quite frankly, and which means we need to find solutions out there that would allow us to deploy these things across um, wherever, whenever, and anyhow, really. So um, anyone heard about this product? It's an open source spiffer, yeah? What is spiffer, anybody? Can you tell me? Have you used it before? Right. Kubernetes right. Doing, uh, yeah. Authentication okay. to containers so as if they're needing to make calls across to cloud providers. Awesome. They're getting yeah. Yeah. Credential. Well, that's good, right? Because because Spiffy is in everything right now. Well, Spiffy is secure um, production identity framework for everyone. Uh, quite frankly, I don't like the word everyone. It should have been who can, right? Whoever can, because everyone is, <laughs> is quite large. Um, so I would say for who can, right? But again, it, it's a very good um, open source tool. You probably need to check it out. And it's one of the standards for um, your identity in Zero Trust. Uh, I'll you know, go through how that works and how it's been deployed. And then Spire, uh, Spire there is a runtime engine for Spiffy. Spiffy is like the... Um, concept of uh, identity and then the Spire is the implementation so that's the runtime you deploy stuff that goes on to Spire. So what is it exactly is, is it, it gives you the way of making sure that especially around workloads where you deploy whether it be in a cloud native environment or non-cloud native environment every resource will have an ID and it's called an SVID, a SPIFA ID and that ID identifies who that is. And then, and then if you want to talk to a different workload, you need to have an ID signed by X509, and that we have a TLS, MTLS connectivity between them, right? So, so it's a universal identity control plane for distributed system. And that just goes to show you a little bit about the cryptographical um, services involved in that. So the core component of uh, Spiffy is You've got the Spiffy ID, like I did say, and then you've got your SV. SV is the, as you can see, it follows that little format. I should have made that more larger, but it's, it's, it's got the Spiffy ID, and, and then uh, the name, your cluster.local can be your trust domain, all right? Uh, it can be a registered domain plane. So the idea is you want to isolate your uh, environment into siloed clustered domains, right? So the point is that if you have a bad player or your network is breached, it's easier to, for you to only have your trust domain affected or impl implicated by the breach. And then you can easily, well, it actually does it automatically. It recycles the certificate for you. And then so the player will only have a very mini, small um, window of time to do any damage, which is almost impossible, to be honest. So that's the identity there. So it gives you that identity and then workload API. So your, uh, you can have your Kubernetes deployment, will have a, his own ID, and then there is what is called node, node attestation as well, it comes with a Spiffy ID. Just gonna, so this is how it works, right? So in the Spiffy world, you got a node attester and then you got a notifier and upstream. Upstream will be an authority that you've defined and your key management, those are all plugins on the Spiffy server. It's more like a, uh, a server agent deployment, right? So you have one standard server and that server controls everything, including your trust domain that you actually pl plugged into your Spiffy environment. And then what it does is it does, it, this, the Spire server um, generates the um, certificate for you, right? So you define the trust domain. So in case you have Say you're deploying, uh, let's use a use case, say you've got um, an IT team and a finance, finance team and all that stuff. You can actually say finance.com as the trust domain for finance and then it.com for the trust domain. And then you actually have them registered. And then what it does is only the guys in IT or the other domain will only have access. And then if you want to have cross access, 
then what this guy does is it creates a, a bundle, right? That bundle will have the certificate of authority, and then they can all talk to each other through MTLS. So that's what it does, right? So it's got a, you can have a key manager as well. You have your or plug in to um, you, know, you know put the your keys there and data stores as well. So this this is what it does. So when that happens, right? So you've got a deployment, a standard deployment with a Spire server, and then you've got Spire agents running across your node. So it's a stateful deployment for Spire server, and then your agents become daemon sets, right? So you could have 50 nodes, and then in all 50 nodes, you have one copy of the Spire agent running. And then so what it does is the Spire agent talks to the Spire server and say, do you have a MTLS identity for me? And then if that, that is the case, then it issues an identity for the Spire server. And then the nodes, since it sits on the, uh, since the agent sits on the node, what it does then is for each of those agents, it be able to issue a SPFA ID for your workload, okay? So the format is you do actually for each registration, you do a re node registration and a workload registration. So the node is the node that your daemon set is running on, right? Okay, and then it's got its own SPFA ID. You can actually have a SPFA ID for the server and a SPFA ID for the agent. That's the regional node attestation. And then after that, you have the workload where you say, well, I, my nodes can attest and, and communicate. I do have a workload that I want to identify. So if you have 50 workloads, all you do is you run a command that does workload registration, and it gives all the workloads an ID, and those IDs are also tied to the trust domain, right? So then you actually have a, a fine-grained protection, okay? So, right, so here is the multi-cloud deployment, this, this is quite interesting because this is a, a different strategy, right? So in this strategy, what you are looking at, we've got a tool in SPIFA called the SPIFA Control Manager. So the SPIFA Control Manager does uh, workload registration and it does a federation. So federation is you have multiple clusters. So you may have a cluster in Azure, another one in AWS GCP. And then you've got this control manager who says, you know what, I need you to talk to each other without having to use a credentials, you know? You don't need a credentials, quite frankly. So your access key and password is non-relevant in this case. Because what it does is, it, uh, for this one, you've got a root certificate there that talks to a bundle. A bundle is a CA, Certificate of Authority, that has all your uh, certificates that have been generated by the SPIFA, so they all actually bundle together. Then what it does is workloads on, on this guy here, on AWS, will talk to this, to, to the bundle on the control manager, and then Azure as well will talk to each other. So they have, just have a, a mesh, right? So those mesh of certificate will go through an NTLS, making sure uh, if you require an ID or if you want to authenticate through to the other server or the other services there, then you must make sure that you have the certificate root on the bundle server and then the generated certificate also will be part of the whole cycle. So that sort of gives you a federation. So if I'm in AWS, I can decide to have my front end sitting in AWS, my React application, and then my back end sitting in Azure, and I'll still be able to talk to them without having any access key, right? So that's actually very cool, isn't it, yeah? Is that cool or not? <laughs> well, that's cool, in my opinion, <laughs> right? So, so what it does then is uh, you got this security performance and operational overhead. Now, the whole thing here is just talking about the fact that you could potentially have silos, right? Silos with multiple trust domains, okay? You kind of split it out into multiple, you know, little trust domains across regions and across, across teams. But then again, the overhead of managing all that is high. So you kind of want to limit it to a small number of trust domains that can communicate to it with each other, okay? So that's actually how, I mean, obviously there's a lot that goes on behind that little diagram anyway, okay? So now, just a little bit about what goes on behind the trust domain um, uh, and then the control manager. So what we've done actually is we've built this 
registration using the di di MySQL or, or Dynamo, actually MySQL is better. So what it does is it, it creates this workload registration happens automatically, and then you have an ID. So ID of all the workloads is registered on that database. You've got a service that is provided, okay, and that service talks to um, every, every of the um, uh, identity that has been provided there. So, okay, cool, let's just run. So on the other hand as well, we've talked about authentication. Now let's have a little bit of, about authorization. Authorization, we use these three things called here. Uh, zero trust authorization, we have Istio. Anyone used Istio before? We've got open policy agent, and then we've got open, okay? So OPA provide a data source across them, right? And then OPA is just a policy engine that is being used to uh, authorize access controls, right? So that's just a little bit, a little bit of uh, how that is done there. And then, uh, so this is the architecture of an open policy agent. Uh, obviously, you've got demons that you can use there, and then you have library. Again, it's, they are agents running across your deployment. So what we've done as well, we've used this thing called external authorization, right? External authorization is quite cool, to be honest. So um, all the um, agents deployed talks to an Envoy proxy, an Envoy proxy in our workload. That's the Envoy between it. And then the reason why Envoy is special, because Envoy uses gRPC, right? gRPC for XDX, which is a service discovery service, which is cool, really, yeah? So you can then talk to, rotate your MTLS certificate. All right, so this is what we've done as well in terms of writing the code, the policy that goes through that whole thing, yeah? We write rego policies for that, allow deny, and then custom, custom rego policy for all that bit. This is just a snippet, a snippet of it. And then we have one, this is also cool, right? So we, the way we deployed ours is we have a replicator. So data source uh, sits somewhere else in um, Cosmo DB, right? And then we have uh, OPA. So the whole point is we want to have a dynamic uh, way of policy definition. So in case something happens, we have actually removed the power of, say, I mean, if you're a developer here, you know sometimes you write ASP.net, ASP my uh, membership registration and all that stuff, which is actually embedded in code. But here we've taken all that, so a developer just checks in the code, it doesn't do anything about groups or ID or access control. So everything is injected through a request call, right, using a JOLT token. And then we then have this data source, which we are built separately externally from the system. It's quite cool, I tell you. <laughs> it's quite, quite cool. All right. And then the, the, the patterns that we've used, we have a pattern where we have a single injection pattern. And then the ones that is cool that I actually developed myself is a dual injection pattern where applications come in and using a JOT token. So within your request headers, you get all that information. We extract it, we verify it, and that's cool. And then on the other hand, you have your ID tokens and access token coming through a Lambda, and then the data source pass through is to, uh, you have OPA defining that, uh, well, with a bit of k at the back, right? So uh, just to talk about the technology stack behind the GRPC, anyone use GRPC? It's quite cool. Yeah, it's, it's good, because that actually allows MTLS communication. It does recycling of certificate. And a small footprint, remote procedure call for it, which is awesome. And that's the uh, things that GRPC do. You can all pick it up there. And then, so coming back to the, my last uh, bond toast thing. So the idea of the joke originally was the fact that in your network, most networks have a good perimeter crossed at the back, right? But when that is breached, you have a black bond toast, really, which means you need to have your zero trust protecting that middle tier. All right, so that's my presentation. Thank you all. Brilliant, uh, excellent. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you. And uh, yes, that was a deliberate mic drop when I <laughs> In your first toaster. Yeah. Okay, so has anybody got any questions for Anthony? Yes, over here. Right. There you go, sir. Uh, 
can we host actually OBA in the in our in-house uh, environment? Because the OBA actually could be connected to the cloud, but uh, open policy agent, uh, open policy uh, India. So if you have, I mean, they are providing cloud-based services, but if you have to internally uh, deploy, see, will it be possible? Sorry, I don't, I don't get the question again. Sorry, can you so repeat? The, so actually, we have the open policy, the open policy agent. So, yeah. so we want to, we want inside actually, on premise actually to deploy, not uh, to deploy, I mean, uh, go to their cloud environment. Yeah. And, yeah that's, uh, that's what the solution actually we want. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 actually. So you, you would, and actually to make it work for you, you need an Envoy proxy, right? A service mesh. So the idea is if you deploy it, in outside your network, because you see it's, it's tied, there is an image, right? A rootless image or Envoy and open policy agent. So you have that, you need to put in, uh, inject that into a container. But they actually deploy separately, right? And then expose port 9191 as a service, right? Once you expose that, you obviously put a DNS and an IP, a public IP to it. Then you have OPA API. So you didn't, all you then need to do is just make sure you have OPA agents running across your, uh, your, you know, your on-premise environment to talk to that port 9191 there and write your regular policy and then that's, that's it. You can do that, quite frankly. You don't actually need to be completely on the cloud. You can have a, a dual cloud or even have a cloud and a hybrid, yeah? Okay. Great. Uh, any more questions? No? Okay. All right then. So uh, just one more time. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you guys. Yeah.